Rachel Skinner is president of the Institution of Civil Engineers and an executive director of WSP. In her virtual presidential address in November last year, she starred in a really impactful documentary about climate change, where she spoke to politicians and leaders, from the mayors of Stockholm and Los Angeles, to the Committee on Climate Change chairman, Lord Deben, and chair of the National Infrastructure Commission, Sir John Armit. She ended with the call to her members. What are you going to do? So I started off by asking Rachel, uh, and she's just over halfway through her term, what impact did she feel her stirring message has had on the institution and its members? I, I've had, oh gosh, I mean hundreds of responses from people all over the place just coming back directly to me saying I want you to know what it is that I'm going to do and so on, which is, which is brilliant, but of course completely you know out of control in terms of I, I can't possibly be the person where you know I act the post box and try and sort of farm all those different things out and join them all together and so on so from an ICE point of view uh, we've created a program called Carbon Champions which is where people can in fact share their stories their ideas if they've started to measure something do things differently they can they can essentially be recognized for that and we can start to broadcast and share that much more much more clearly but more generally I mean what's really exciting is that the diversity of ideas that are coming through because we've never really thought about this climate issue and the, and the potential to change the way that we plan and design and build and then operate all these infrastructure systems, we've never thought about it properly. So there is masses and masses of low hanging fruit out there. There are so many things we can do quite easily, sometimes actually cost less in order to bring through change quite fast. And that of course has to be the priority. One way I found that seems to be cutting through is to describe net zero as a bath, where essentially you imagine that the, the tap is the point where all the carbon emissions are coming from or the water is coming from. So we can turn the tap up. We can obviously turn it back down again if we choose to do so. Um, so the tap is the emissions that are going into the bath or the, or the carbon dioxide emissions that are going up into the atmosphere. And the plug hole or the drain is the ability of the, the planet essentially to cope with that level of flow into the bath so you know the, the bigger and the better the, the plug hole or the drain the faster we can process those carbon emissions back out of the atmosphere and turn them into something that is less harmful so net zero as a whole is about the balance it's about the level of the bath water it's about trying to bring the level of the bath water down as far as possible because then it is much easier and much cheaper and much less risky and all the rest of it to actually generate a proper net zero balance. In other words, where, where the carbon dioxide emissions we put up into the atmosphere are matched by the amount we can take out again. At the moment, we are so far the wrong side of the line. It is just not true. The bath is filling up. It is potentially in danger of overflowing. We do not know in terms of global systems what will happen if the bath overflows. Nobody knows. And so what we have to do, I think, as engineers is work, as I say, to bring that level of bath water, that level of carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere down as fast as we can. So carbon cutting, carbon reduction, all these mitigation measures we can, we can think of, but also bring through the technologies and also the nature-based systems which can work harder for us on the drain or the plug hole side of things to process those emissions so much faster. That is the only way we're going to get to net zero and that has to be our attack strategy on carbon in terms of what we need to do in the next handful of years. This is not a problem to come to in 2048 and say, oh, right, we better get on with this now. <laughs> this is something we have to do from right now. The other thing I guess I would add to that is that that is all about the attack strategy. That is how we mitigate in terms of trying to put right the effects that we have already caused over the last couple of hundred years that are now generating these changes in our climate. We also now need a defence strategy because we are too late to put right all of those impacts in a short amount of time. And this is where all the pieces around climate resilience come in, all the pieces around adaptation. And we're going to have to think about the risks to all of our infrastructure assets out there, all of the systems out there, and, and what it means for them to operate under a changing climate. And that could be everything from a single building or a single anything really, to up to the level of the whole national infrastructure systems that we rely on every single day. We, at the moment, are starting to do that thinking, 
but there is so much more to do because we know we have 30 years of a worsening climate ahead of us no matter what else we do and even if we get to that 30 year point so roughly 2050 if we haven't taken enough action fast enough to cut the carbon out of the system we're going to have even more years ahead of us where things just continue to get worse and worse and worse so from an engineering point of view I, I just think we couldn't have a clearer mandate, frankly, because none of us want to live in a world where our quality of life comes down. We all want to live in a world where, in fact, we can continue to, to grow and thrive and so on. And the only way to do that is if we can genuinely get to grips with the whole of this climate action piece. So you ask members, uh, what are you going to do? So what sort of things have they come up with? Oh, loads and loads of different things, hundreds of different ideas, which is great. I've had, as I've been going round and meeting lots of the ICE members in various regional events, whether they're international or around the UK, some of them have actually, uh, as an event, they've pulled together all of their ideas and commitments and they've actually sort of almost committed to each other in terms of the things they're going to do. So those who are involved at the, the planning end of the spectrum uh, are talking about, you know, I am going to think about how I plan differently. I'm going to think longer term. I'm going to think about proper sustainable outcomes as opposed to just, right, we need to put, you know, this many of these things here and that many over there and so on. Uh, the design side of things, all sorts of ideas coming forward around everything from different materials to ways to reduce waste, ways to extend the life of assets, all sorts of different ideas there. Uh, and of course, on site, the construction element of things, I mean, there's just so many different ways to, to go about things differently and actually end up with the same functional product or outcome or whatever, but in a wider context, something that doesn't cause as much harm as before. There is still a very long way to go, though a very, very long way to go. And I think overall, we've just got to get to grips with this idea that we're going to have to think differently about infrastructure. These carbon dioxide emissions are really tricky, aren't they? They're invisible. They don't respect boundaries. You know, they're, they're out there. And unless we go looking for them, we aren't going to just stumble across them, which is exactly why we've got ourselves into the muddle, I guess, that we're now in. And so we have to get much more savvy, I think, as I guess architects and engineers in thinking about, right, so how would I work towards something that genuinely can deliver in its own, you know, own right, something that is going to deliver against the net zero objective? OK, so I have to understand what the impacts are. I have to obviously try and eliminate those impacts if I can. I have to try and reduce them as far as possible. I have to mitigate any residual impact. We recognise this, right? It's just mitigation, just a different type of mitigation. It's the same as any other impact that we might have. And then once we've understood actually how these different impacts come together, we need to just think about, okay, so, so over the long run lifespan of this particular thing I'm creating here, what can I do to make sure that that net zero balance is genuinely maintained? And I think really important here to understand net zero is not the same as absolute zero when it comes to carbon dioxide emissions. We are not saying we have to eliminate every carbon dioxide emission from everything everywhere tomorrow. Obviously, ideally, we work towards a real zero, but in the meantime, we have to just get that balance more right. So I've had people from all over the world coming up with all sorts of ideas. And as I, as I mentioned before, we've, we've started from an ICE point of view to, to launch some pieces around carbon champions to try to, I guess, gather up these stories and start to share them more actively, but in, in a validated way, not just any old stories, the good stories, if, <laughs> if that makes sense, because we don't want to share mediocre practice. We obviously want to share the really, really good practice. For, from an ICE point of view as an organisation, we've also seen some pretty significant change in the last few months. We've rewritten our strategic plan for the next five years, so the top two objectives now relate to climate action. Number one is decarbonisation. Number two is climate resilience. That is not a coincidence. We're changing the requirements in terms of university syllabus uh, side of things in terms of what everybody will be taught about as they come through the accredited civil engineering courses around you know, the entirety of the, the, the civil engineering university network. Uh, we're changing the way people will get qualified. We've had a sustainability attribute for decades, but now we have to give it teeth. It has to mean something in the current context uh, and not just be something which perhaps, you know, is a relatively soft touch. So all of those different things are already happening alongside many, many other things. But yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive. There is a lot going on. Is it enough? We will see, but it feels like we're at least on a path now and the trick is going to be to, to accelerate that action and not let it just drift off again um, and then realise in three years' time that we should have been going much, much faster. <laughs> yeah. So you're a transport planner, 
And you said that the way we are investing in infrastructure is unsustainable. Mm. So in your professional life at WSP, and what's the firm doing to address <laughs> those issues? Uh, it's a good question, absolutely, because we have to you know, walk the walk as well. It's no good me just talking the talk, is it? So I guess two parts to this answer. From the point of view of, uh, of my own transport team, one of the things that we've been working on for a couple of years actually now is coming up with a new set of tools and techniques which we've called Carbon Zero, um, which is essentially around uh, com looking across the range of common transport solutions, largely in urban areas, that we tend to have a lot of across the country in lots of different places for lots of different local authorities, combined authorities, you name it. Um, and we've been trying to get to grips with what the genuine carbon impacts of that sort of scheme really will be. And once you actually start to understand it, both in terms of the, the, you know, the, the design and the construction stage, but also that whole life piece, you can really then start to understand what you have to do to mitigate that impact. We've been trialling that with a range of different clients, and, and actually it's, it, it's going really well. It's interesting, it's sort of it's growing as we discover there are more questions to answer. It's a bit like Pandora's box, because you start off and you think, right, that's the question, and then you realise, oh, hang on a sec, there's 10 more questions in here, and it's quite complicated. But, but actually, we're, we're trying very hard to keep things upstream at the front end and to start to give, you know, a, a, I guess, the best possible advice to, to clients on that basis. The other thing that we've done from the point of view of the whole of our UK business for WSP is that uh, we've made a new commitment uh, as a sort of a, a you know, the, the UK organisation as a whole to say that by 2030 we will halve the impact of our designs and advice that we provide to clients in terms of their, their carbon emissions impacts. So that's from a 2020 baseline to be done by 2030. So we've been quite clear and, and as specific as possible in terms of what we're trying to shoot at. The reaction to that from the market has been really interesting because what we're trying to, what we're trying to do is set the right objective. What we don't quite yet have, of course, is necessarily the exact mechanisms by which we could do that across every single sector at every stage of the life cycle. But it's not just us as WSP who are going to have to do this because halving the impact of what we do is the, is the goal to work towards over this current decade. We, we need to fill in those gaps. So it's been a really useful process to start to figure out, you know, okay, so, so let's look at the building sector. Right, okay, there are some good tools and techniques there. Where can we spread that across into other sectors? Where are the gaps? Where does that not work? What other methods are we going to need to, to really get to grips with these impacts and, and genuinely work towards that proper halving by 2030? So there's, there's a few of us who are quite actively involved <laughs> in trying to make sure that we have that figured out and we can see where those gaps are. And I guess the, the inspiration really for doing that is that we recognised some time ago that if we only look at our direct carbon emissions, so what some people would call scope one and two emissions, the things that are generated by the organisation itself, so things like you know the energy our, our offices use or travel of employees, that kind of thing, that is such a tiny tip of the iceberg in, in terms of the potential impact we could have, the benefit we could bring through on behalf of all of our clients around the scope three emissions, the designs, the advice, the actual business that we do, the work that we do, it just felt that it was a bit of a nonsense to only focus in one tiny you know, tip of the problem and, and to ignore the enormous <laughs> iceberg under the surface. So it's a pretty genuine effort to try and make the right changes. I suppose these days so that clients also are pretty aware, yeah. aren't they? And they're expecting something from you which yes. will actually solve their problem yes. too. I think that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, the more conversations I have around this, the more comfortable, the more confident I guess I certainly become, and I know others are as well, that actually this is a whole of industry challenge. And I think there is appetite, whether you look at investors and clients or whether you look at the consultancies, the contractors, you know, the wider supply chain, the, the onward system operators of all different types, actually everybody does see the issue and they are all trying to work out, you know, what, what's mine to do? So, so with one of my other hats, I, I chair the carbon work stream of um, the Infrastructure Client Group, which is a group of largely UK, mainly public sector clients. These issues are absolutely on the table around, around that discussion. And, and in terms of you know, what are the things the clients need to do in order to really mandate this change, whether or not we get further legislative change, what can we all just do together anyway? 
Absolutely, that's one of the key questions. And I think it makes it really exciting because actually we're all pushing on the same open door. We just need to get through it as fast as possible. <laughs> very good. Well, Rachel, thank you very much for your inspiring messages and I look forward to results of them over the years. Fantastic, thank you.